Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. A special welcome to our new chairman, newly elected chairman, Rob Wing, who will close the session today. I'm sure most of you would have preferred to be at Killsby, but this is the next best thing. We have over 120 who have signed up for this webinar today. Hopefully we have included items which are relevant to full size and miniature owners and operators. If you have any questions during the presentations, please submit them via the chat button. If we don't manage to answer them this morning, we will publish the questions on the website and in steaming which will be out shortly. Whilst on the subject of steaming, Brian Gooding, our editor, is always looking for more articles, so get writing. I'm sure that some of you have some interesting photographs and tales to tell. For those who have not already heard, we've had to cancel the driving course this year, although it may be possible to hold it later in the year. The update of traction engines and the law is coming soon. We have now got the draft manuscript and we will be looking to publish it in the near future. Our thanks go to Dr. Raymond Rowe and Nigel Hawkes who have been working on this. Normally, when we have a physical meeting, Cathy Smith brings along her bookstall. Today, we ask you to go to the website and look at the books and other items that we have for sale and purchase them from there. Cathy will be delighted to help you. The next item on our agenda was should be matters arising from last year's minutes. Uh, if anybody's got any questions from last year's meeting that don't get answered this morning, please email them to me and we will attempt to answer them. I would now like to introduce Martin Levers, Business Unit Director of Walker Midgley Insurance Brokers, who's going to talk to us on the subject of insurance. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for that intro, uh, Bob. That is much appreciated. Um, as you say, we're doing uh, just a quick uh, um, resume of the things that uh, of interest insurance wise to the full size and miniature um, engine owners. Um, so really, without further ado, um, I guess it's, I'll just start going through a bit um, uh, the the covers that uh, that, that we offer on uh, on the uh, steam. I'll do the full size one first. So the full size one. The main point is that it's an any driver policy uh, that gives uh, full road traffic cab cover and there's no minimum age for drivers and young drivers don't have to be steam apprentices um, and they code for anywhere on the road uh, and off road but obviously remember if you're driving on the road you must have the uh, appropriate driver license for that. Uh, the use on the policy is social domestic and pleasure use which includes use for rallies, shows, working demonstrations, road runs, that sort of thing. Most of it was used whilst towing, so you've got your living vans, your water carts, coal carts, etc. It excludes use for hire or reward, but it does include use for driver training and driver experience. It includes cover for carriage of passengers, either in or on your engine, or on a trailer pulled by the engine, providing that you don't actually receive any... Um, and remuneration other than your applicable expenses, buy fuel, and uh, that sort of thing. The engine is covered whilst it's in transit, uh, whilst either on your own low loader or on a low loader belonging to somebody else. Obviously, if that's important, rally by contract. Some insured that you insure your engine for, if you wish to have the accidental damage, fire, and theft cover, it can be any amount chosen by yourselves up to the engine's current market value. I guess a lot of engine owners, uh, especially perhaps on some of the more expensive ones, perhaps um, don't want to insure for the full value. It could be very, very expensive. And I guess that uh, they believe that they will um, just insure for the uh, value of a, what might be a sort of reasonable size claim uh, and insure for that instead. So there's no underinsurance penalty. Claims will be paid in full up to the insured chosen by you uh, for all claims other than a theft claim where it's still un un not recovered, 
you would retain engine uh, ownership of your engine. The, the way the premiums worked out, there's a flat premium for uh, road traffic act cover, uh, road traffic act, the old cover. And then we have four bands of premium for the accidental damage, fire and theft, which depends on the sum insured. Um, so it goes up to say the first 65,000 is charged X, X amount, and then beyond, uh, in between 65 and 120,000 is a reduced amount and, and so on. So the engine with its constituent parts, whether attached or detached or covered anywhere uh, within the geographical limits of the policy, which is the uh, UK and EU. On our policy, the UK optional cover for your living vans, engine trailers, water carts, that sort of thing. In addition, you can also have your home workshop buildings, cover, machinery, tools, equipment, stock of spare parts, that sort of option covers that are, are available. Probably the most perhaps significant change is the um, following Brexit. There's the green cards. You're now required to carry a physical green card whilst driving your vehicle in EU countries. You can now have it on a white piece of paper now rather than uh, the actual physical green card itself. The green card is a is an international certificate of insurance which is issued by the insurance industries to ensure that the motorist has the necessary minimum insurance cover required for driving in that country you travel to. Uh, so you just need to contact us in good time and so we can get the uh, green card issued for you. So moving on to the miniature model road steam policy. It's actually very similar to the uh, full size. So this one covers uh, models and miniature steam road vehicles up to including six inch scale, uh, along with the ancillary items such as the miniature water carts, miniature riding trailers. Again, it's another any driver policy. There's no minimum age for drivers. You need to ensure that you have the appropriate driving license for it if you're driving on the road. And again, it's used for social, domestic and pleasure use, used for rallies, shows, working demonstrations, road runs and the like. Use whilst towing, excludes again, excludes a high or reward use, but does include the work for driver experience. Public liability road traffic act cover, that gives you the public liability for all the miniature traps and engine activities. And again, includes cover for carriage of passengers in or on your engine or on your trailer, provided uh, you don't receive remuneration of the new out of pocket expenses and other supply of fuel. The engine is covered whilst it's in transit, either in your own vehicle, your own trailer or a low loader, or a low loader belonging to another person. Uh, the sum insured for accidental damage cover is a, a due based on the engine's current market value. So if you put the engine up for sale, what would you expect to receive for it, or what would you have to pay to buy it on a like like basis? Again, claims put, paid in full to the sum insured, chosen by yourselves, and for all claims other than theft, you will retain ownership. It's a flat premium for the road traffic at public liability cover, and it's a single premium rate for accident damage fire and theft because it's not a uh, split rate like it's in, uh, on the whole size. And again, there's covers there that you can have for uh, your living miniature living vans, engine trailers, water carts, etc. And again, you can have optional covers that you might want to consider for your home workshop, buildings, machinery, tools, equipment, stock of your spare parts, uh, and no trailers. Green cards again, same thing applies uh, if you if you need to go, if you're going abroad with your engine, uh, you'll need to now contact us to arrange a green card so that you can demonstrate you have the relevant cover abroad. Uh, and a van or a low loader cover. It's designed so we can cover vans, pickups, lorries, articulated vehicles. It's used for the transport, transportation of your models, that can include locos, steam road vehicles, portable engines, vintage tractors. Vehicles, living vans, trailer court, you can see that sort of thing on there and the like. It's an any driver policy over 25, so we don't need to have any named drivers. Um, the only ones we do need to know about, and you'd have to contact us first. Uh, so, any, if you want anybody under 25, you would, um, you would need uh, a copy driving license, and there will be an additional cost for that. The annual mileage limit is up to 6,000 miles per year. The cover is third party cover plus accidental damage, fire, death, and essentially a comprehensive policy, uh, subject to 250,000 excess. The cover is social domestic pleasure use only and use whilst towing. So there's no business use cover on this whatsoever. It's just purely pleasure use and use and use whilst towing. So if you're carrying somebody else's engine. So it does exclude hire or reward, but you can carry someone else's engine. And again, they can just pay the out of pocket expenses and fuel costs. Importantly, there's no cover for the load itself carried, either yours or anyone else's on the van line of a loaded policy. 
purely covering the actual use of the vehicle itself. There are now discounted rates for NTET members. Now, on the proposal form, we do ask if you're a member of the NTET. So, to nest on that, we've got the discounted rate. And again, similar thing on the green cards. We now need to uh, take one uh, abroad with this again, contract at the time. Uh, we can manage to get that uh, green card issued and have a sent or emailed out to you. Finally, Bob asked me some questions that have been raised about um, engines being transported. Um, so, there are several um, scenarios here. Uh, so, I've done my best to answer these. So, if you're carrying your own engine on your own trailer or low loader, as I just said, the low loader policy doesn't provide any cover for the loads being carried itself. It's the engine policy that has the cover, provided, of course, that you have accidental damage fire cover on your engine. If you just have third party only cover, there's obviously no cover for the damage to your engine anyway. If you're carrying, uh, using a contractor to carry your engine as a commercial arrangement, the contractor should be providing cover for that. What I would say is you make sure that if you're getting contracted to do it, that you make sure it's on an all risks or full responsibility basis, and not one of the RHA covers for your conditions of carriage. The RHA conditions of carriage only provide a maximum cover, and it's round about £1,300 per tonne. So when I sort of seven or eight ton traction engine, that's not going to give them very much cover. So again, make sure that you get it written and agreed that it's an all risk or full responsibility basis. So if you're asking, uh, you're transporting an engine owner for a friend, um, it's a non-commercial arrangement, again, the cover would be on the engine owner's policy. So that again, provided they have the accidental damage fire that cover on the engine. There's no cover, again, on the van or low loader policy. I suspect if you're, um, if you're using your own car and trailer, your own car insurance or trailer will not have any cover from a load being carried. So yes, just make sure that you have the uh, damage fire that cover on your own engine if it's been transported. Uh, How is the load insured? Well, that would be by the contractor, which again needs to check the condition of the carriage that you're signing, whether RHA or risks or full responsibility. So the RHA one is very limited in its uh, liability, so make sure that you're trying to get it on an all risks or full responsibility basis. And obviously, if you're using uh, the engine owner's own engine policy, if it's, uh, if it's being transported, that way that's the wrong use your own engine policy. So now about what happens to the vehicles involved in a collision rolls down and back and catches fire. Does the, uh, does the cost of rebuilding might be more than the cost of a single type? Does the insurers give an arbitrary right to the farm in the limits that remains? The engine policy, the amount payable in the event of claim is up to the sum insured that you've selected and paying for. And the owners, you do retain ownership of your engine. The only time you wouldn't retain ownership is if it was a and you would not repeat it. And then finally, and they want to be fussed about how their engine is secured down and won't let the haulers secure it and how they prefer. And the load moves, will the haulers insurance still pay out or will the insurance be declared void? As it will secure the well, the first thing to ensure is that you know the conditions of carriage that you're that the engine is being carried under. If you sign a contract of carriage under RHA, you're only going to get the of about £1,300 per tonne, so make sure that you get an all this sort of responsibility for the full value. Really. The holders should, should be the experts in this, um, and they're responsible for the load being carried. If the load is not secured correctly, that's the holder's responsibility. He's the expert, and that's what you're paying him for to do. That's the end of my presentation. So, thank you for thank listening. You, I, was, uh, I think the important thing that you need to stress is that whoever is providing your insurance, you need to read the small print carefully because Absolutely. your policy may not be the same as others. Yes, uh, as I said, the, uh, if, if you just have a third party only policy, then obviously you're not going to have any damage for cover on your engine itself anyway. Um, but certainly if it's been transported by a haul, yeah, as I, said, I think that's probably the most important to make sure that uh, they're covering it on the basis of the engine in the event of, a, uh, of an incident, and not the limited liability RHA covers. Well, thank you very much, Martin. I've no doubt it will prompt some questions which we'll come back to you with uh, okay. if we can get them dealt with today. We now move on to David, David Smith. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope I can uh, keep you entertained in the way that Martin has. Let me go forward with my presentation here. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do, what the, what the TSU does. Uh, 
<clears throat> within the NTT. Uh, you hear me talk quite often, uh, but I wonder how many of you actually know what's going off in the background. I'll be as quickly, quick as I can, but I just want to lay this on you, if you would allow. We're listening to government. We've got various uh, ports open, if you like, using a technical term. Uh, we're listening to emails. We're listening to government websites. And we also have a number of friends, I guess, who feed us with information. Have you seen this and have you seen the other, which is very, very useful. Very useful indeed. It gives us a bit of a heads up about what's going on. We're obviously concerned about environmental issues. This is not going to go away. We can't wish it away. Um, there are issues, there are problems, and we must try and face up to them. What I would say is that we must not deny uh, what's happening to our planet. We're part of it, and we should join in the process of trying to make it better. As, as well as we can. We're still involved in inspection standards, keeping a watching eye and listening to people. We don't enjoy a very good conversation with our colleagues within the Association of Independent Boiler Inspectors. Uh, and that's something hopefully we're going to be working on in the future. But we don't have a day to day conversation, let's put it that way. <clears throat> we work alongside the Federation of Historic British Vehicle Clubs uh, and we're uh, affiliated to them and they're our avenue uh, into DFT, the Department for Transport. It, we used to do this for ourselves but frankly they're far far better at it, they're much more tuned in than we are and I'm really happy now that we've got them to understand what makes steam work that they knock on the door on our behalf so that's what happens there. <clears throat> We are also associated with the National Transport Trust. And again, they're a lobbying organization and they give us access to the DCMS, which is the Department for Digital Culture. You'll see I've got culture in red there, which is us, media and sport. And then we've, we've got the fairly new Heritage Fuels Alliance, which gives us access to the DCMS and to DEFRA and to other departments. The problem we have, quite frankly, that there is no one department in government that the heritage movement can talk to because everything that we're involved with cuts right across other departments, transport, culture in itself, uh, the environment uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth, licensing and so on. And what we're anxious to do within the Heritage Fuels Alliance is to get people together who can talk to us uh, on behalf of, of the government as a whole. We're getting closer to that. And we're affiliated to the Historic Railways Association. We obviously do not run railways, um, but we are very close cousins. And it's important to understand and, and accede to the fact that they are the largest users of coal in the heritage movement. And where they go, we have to move with them. That's a fact. That's an absolute fact. But we move with them on our terms, that's the deal, that's the deal. Okay, <clears throat> the member services that we offer, insurance, we've just been listening to Martin, um, we've worked very closely over the years with, with Walker Missley, very good friends, you'll hear a little bit more from my point of view there. Um, <clears throat> if anybody brings new policies to markets or has a query, although we're not insurance brokers and we're not qualified, we actually hold that policy up to the light and make a judgment as to whether it's fit for purpose. And then we go and ask an expert to comment on what we think we're finding. <clears throat> V765 and V55, we provide assistance to members and non-members who have got machines that they want to bring back to life. The, the <clears throat> people have donated them to them or they've found them or they've bought them and they want to put them back on the road with, with legitimate registrations. We're very much involved in that, although there aren't that many of them these days. And here we have it, our good old breakdown and recovery scheme. 20 years over now it's been running, giving peace of mind to uh, engine owners and uh, drivers of uh, HGVs, private HGVs, I have to say. And pardon my horrible pun, it's still as cheap as chips. It really, really is excellent value for money. If any of you have used it, you can hopefully testify to that. Who's doing what? Well, I'm very quickly, Ian Cooper, a name you might be aware of, you might live close to Ian, or you might have used his service. He he's, uh, runs our insurance side and he's the link man with the people who provide insurance into our 
into our hobby. Uh, Colin Melvin Harris, uh, he operates the 365 system for us. And then we've got John Durling there, uh, who is our link uh, with the uh, Federation of British Historic Vehicle Clubs and also the National <clears throat> Transport Trust as well. Uh, not listed there, not necessarily a full-time member of my team, but we've got Tony Seddon, who has been a great help to me while we've been working on coal and more, more of that later on. And then we've got another gang of people working from time to time um, who have helped to put together our new website. They've helped to put together this webinar. They've helped to put together the new membership management systems. These are the techie people sat behind the screens who helped me. These are the work areas that we're working on internally. We look after not we don't write the codes of practice that's not in our remit but we just check them for consistency are they compliant with statute are they saying all the right thing about industry standards and so on like that a watching brief um, really important gdpr it won't go away uh, there was a great hiatus when it was introduced big rush uh, it's fairly simple but we are very careful to be sure that we don't cross over the what are almost invisible lines from time to time to be able to be honest with you. Uh, website hosting I've referred to, we'll stay away from there. Membership systems I've referred to as well, and we give ongoing support to those. And last but not least, all of our officers work from home. Um, there is no corporate NTT building, ivory tower or whatever you want to call it. Everybody's far flung. And so part of our job is to keep them ticking and make sure they can talk to us uh, 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 over the internet and their web services, their email services are running and their equipment's running okay. Walker Midgley, uh, we just heard Martin there. As I've said, <coughs> they're, <laughs> they're owned by Terragate now, of course. They pay us commission. I have to tell you that that commission is falling. Uh, Walker Midgley, like any other insurer at the moment, is not having a very good ride of it. People are moving around, which is the rightful thing to do. It, their prices have gone up. Uh, the steam fraternity is very, very careful about how it spends its money and it will move if it thinks it's got to. And this is what's been happening. Uh, and they're good guys at Walker Midgley. There's no doubt about that, but they have suffered like other insurers have as well. And of course, Tony Wood, our fruit gum lobber. If you've been at Killsby, then you've been a target for uh, his Maynard's fruit gums from time to time. We shall miss him and I wish him well in his retirement. Brilliant guy. The majority of people at Walker Midgley are working from home. Um, this has meant you get in a different level of service. Most insurers that are brokering into us are working from home, most of them. And it's different. It's not the same repartee. They haven't got direct access to all the good stuff that normally would have and there's a time lapse between what they're saying they're going to do and sometimes what they're able to do and in particular I know that Walker Midgley don't have access to their disc printer because it's in the office it needs manual attention it needs special discs to be inserted and then their discs have got to be put in the envelope so I would suggest that probably no one inside lockdown have had a, a, an insurance disc from Walker Midgley and then early last year, much to their great embarrassment, they had a severe systems failure. Uh, a number of, of their <clears throat> uh, business fraternity in the area where they're located in Sheffield were subjected to an external denial of service. And that really did take them to the wall for a short while, two or three days. In particular, low loaders. They've been very good with low loaders at Walker Midgley. Uh, but you, some of you might remember that Royal Sun Alliance suddenly decided they were going to level the playing field. If it was a commercial vehicle, everybody was going to pay the same rates and the, and the rates went sky high. <clears throat> Wasn't very good at all. Uh, Walker Midgley responded to this and they found a new underwriter, Travellers. And oh, Tony Woods was telling me before he retired, <clears throat> and these are the rates he gave me. These are the discounted rates for NTET members. If you're not an NTET member, you won't get those rates. And on top of those rates, the NTT gets a small commission, which is really very useful. Okay. Tony Woods did say to me <clears throat> that the insurance market is hardening. 
and we can expect 20% increases in some places, and these aren't in common. And they themselves have, have raised their rates by 3% uh, since November. Okay, I'm going to talk now about one broker. <clears throat> one broker we work very hard with to bring to the market. We needed a, a, another broker in the game because we weren't getting much joy from Peter James Insurance. They've since moved entirely out of the steam scene and we desperately need to balance up between Walker Midgley, uh, James Campbell, who we hear a little bit about later. There was nobody else. And if we lost Walker Midley, Midgley, they were, we were gonna be in the doo-doo, no doubt about it. Uh, we asked around uh, and one of our, uh, one of the friends of the NTT made a suggestion to his broker who happened to be one broker, why don't you give David Smith a call? <clears throat> To some extent, the rest is history. We very we worked very hard with a young lady called Adele Rand, a Glaswegian, who didn't take prisoners, it turns out. Uh, and we devised a scheme. And on paper, this scheme was brilliant. It was really, really good. You, it, was, it was a no-brainer. Uh, the problem was, we discovered latterly, that there was no depth to the scheme. Uh, she was very, very good at helping us to get where we wanted to go but wasn't too good at getting the processes behind the scene working properly. And I'll say that with the greatest of respect because her heart was in the right place. With that, without a doubt, her heart was in the right place. But she wanted, she was rushing to the end game rather than taking time to look at what was happening under her feet. I'm telling you this in hindsight. And some of you were on the receiving end of these weaknesses because the people you, you were talking to, might, they didn't recognize what a traction engine was. They were talking motor car language and all sorts of stuff. And it was a very frustrating period. And then of course, like every other broker, they were hit by COVID and that knocked them for six. Sean Lenton has taken over from Adele Rand. She's left, she's gone off to other things and good luck to her. Uh, he's a specialist. He's, he's been with one broker for a long, long while. He, he knows steam inside out. Uh, he was anxious to have gotten that job in the first place, but uh, it wasn't to be. Uh, his boss listened to Adele and she won the day, but he's back in the seat now. Uh, his staff, he's got a small group of people and he's putting them through hands-on training. There's, there's one of our members local to where they are, uh, their offices are, who has offered the services of his, of his extensive kit. And they're going to go there with their overalls on and they're going to get dirty. We did that years ago. You might remember, we did it years ago with Footman James when they first came to the market. We had very similar teething troubles, very similar. They didn't understand steam. They couldn't talk the jargon. And when, as soon as somebody tells you that your windscreen's covered on your traction engine, you've got, you know that uh, you're off kilt a little bit. Well, they're working very hard at one broker to bring themselves out of that situation. So there they are. They've got 15 staff uh, on this scheme and on other special interests. Uh, Sean has assured me that although it hasn't happened, commission is coming our way, uh, which is very good, it's excellent. Uh, and also he's working on what they call their loyalty scheme. All these things were in the promise bag when Adele was there, but never came to fruition. They are coming. And retrospectively, I have to tell you, that was his promise to me. And they are a disc scheme agent, but like Walker Midsley, they're outside of the office and to issue a disc means a trip into the office. Now he says to me, they're quite prepared to do that. Some of them live very close. So if there's a disc involved, they'll get it out. That's what their endeavor is. They don't run a low loader scheme at present. They've tried to. They've even talked to the same brokers who are underwriters who are working with uh, James Campbell and with uh, Walker Misley. Can't get the same rates. Cannot get the same rates because they're new to the market. That's what the difficulty is. We understand that. So Sean said to me on Friday when I was talking, he said, give me a second chance. Please say to your audience, when I asked him, what should I say? He said, say to them, please give us a second chance. We've got our act together. We know where it went wrong. We understand all of that. And we want to become a reputable and friendly partner of our community. And so I'm saying to you on their behalf, let's give them a second chance. Give them some space. 
James Campbell. James has been with us almost from year dot. He worked for previous under brokers, uh, underwriters and brokers who serviced, were the only services at that time to the STEAM fraternity. And he went off and did his own thing. And he's been very successful. Uh, he speaks the language. Unfortunately, James has never seen his way to paying any commission to the NTET, which is, a, it, it sort of sits with me a little bit because he makes his living, quite a good living out, out of the STEAM fraternity. It would be nice if he gave a little bit back, but that's my opinion, it might not be yours. <clears throat> he, he, he hasn't responded from to my uh, entreaties to tell me what to say today. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Um, he didn't, he, he simply hasn't replied. He hasn't said, go away and get lost. He just hasn't replied. He's, 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 he does very well. He's a small operation. He works, recently he moved under the umbrella of another in, a broker in the town at Guildford. Uh, and he, but he works in, in an office on, on his own. And of course he operates the insurance disc scheme on our behalf. He does run low loaders as a scheme. Uh, but he bundles them, he prefers to bundle them inside other insurance so that he can get a better deal. You heard Martin Levers telling you about goods in transit being an intrinsic part of the Walker Midgley insurance. And as they are, they will be with one broker when that deal comes to the market. Just check that what you've got from James's uh, uh, policy does cover your goods in transit. Please do check that. And he, we've got no notice of any significant changes, so he's there for the duration. Right, let's get to some nitty gritty. <clears throat> the bill that's been the focus of our attention for two and a half years now becomes law on the 1st of May, 2021. And what this means is that bituminous coal cannot be sold in sealed bags but it can be delivered to the point of use in 50 kilogram open sacks. And domestic burn of bituminous coal must cease by 2023. And the government thinks that that's sufficient time for people who live in houses far flung from the point of distribution to be able to migrate from bituminous coal to other suitable sources of fuel. It's the cause of much derision uh, amongst politicians, I have to tell you, and uh, we're wondering how they're going to do it. But there we go. So domestic burn, and I emphasise domestic, um, has to cease by 2023. Welsh dry steam comb coal, to give it its proper name, as Bob Siddall would insist on it being called, that which we get from currently from Fossil Fran is not f affected at all by any of this legislation. You can burn the fossil fram type of fuel without breaking the law or being concerned about it coming in 25 kilo, kilogram bags. Nothing has changed in that area. There are no longer any deep mines in the UK and you will have heard, although that coal, prospective coal was not going to be of use to uh, the steam fraternity, the mine that was to be uh, reopened and or, or, or extended uh, at Whitehaven is now under scrutiny. It's gone back to public inquiry uh, because the government have had its cage rattled by the environmentalists. We shall see. Fossi Fran is on a time limit. It's coming to the end of its uh, the amount of coal it can get under its current license. And they think that by 2022, they will have, have got all the coal that they will have been allowed to get, and they will have scavenged the floors and, and got rid of their stockpiles sometime by the end of 2022. <clears throat> Paul Paddock, the manager at Fossi Fran, was telling us that they have lodged an appeal to the Welsh Assembly that would allow them, under the terms of their current licence, to take other coals immediately adjacent to where they are, which would extend their life somewhere between six and eight years. Well, I'm not sure we're going to see any advance from the Welsh Assembly. I'm not going to second guess that. It would be nice, but let's see. 
And of course, we've got imports and we, this is not a new thing. We've been fetching coal from Russia and Colombia for a long, long time, a long time. Uh, so it's not, it's not an innovation. It's not something we've suddenly got to start to do. And we've been fetching all types of coal. So there is a breadth of coal there. It might not be that which we are currently used to burning. That's the deal. That's the problem. Distribution. There are three major players in the distribution of fuel. A company called LCP, LCC, sorry, CPL, Coal Products Limited, who used to be an extension of the old National Coal Board many years ago. Bob Siddle will probably tell you one or two uh, uh, tales about those people over a pint of beer. <clears throat> and then there's Hargreaves, of course. And they all plan to continue operating washing, grading, and distribution services. Little bit of a snag, there's no washing facility in this country. Any, any import is taken somewhere else and washed and then brought here and graded as washed coal. The Heritage Fuel Alliance, of which the NTT is a founding member, was formed in April 2019 in the kitchen of East Castle. And James Hervey Bathurst agreed to be its chairman. And James is a patron of the NTT and a very um, great guy, frankly. He's opened lots of doors for us uh, and we've moved forward. The members are ourselves, Heritage Railway Association, the Association of British Transport and Engineering Museums, the FBHVC, the Steamboat Association, the Maritime Trust and the Chuppleworth Collection, and the door is open to any other representative organisation to join the HRA. The, uh, sorry, the HFA, I beg your pardon. And its, its objectives are fairly simple, to develop strategies for supplies and for continuing ability to use fossil fuels as part of the UK's heritage programme. The heritage programme in, in the UK is worth an, an eye-watering amount of money, a seriously eye-watering amount of money. Of all the coal that's burnt in the UK, and there's a lot of it, the heritage burn is quite small, 35, 30 to 35,000 tonnes per annum of which 25K roughly goes to railways and four and a half thousand tonnes thereabouts comes to road steam. And that split 45% bituminous and 55% smokeless, the fossil fram, the, the, the dry well steam coal. And then the remainder goes to people like the museums, the, <coughs> the forges, uh, the steamboats, the tugs and, and all of those sort of things. The, the Heritage Fuel Alliance is conscious that that small amount of coal, 40 to 30, 30 to 40, 30 to 35 tonnes of coal, is a small number. And it wants to be sure that we can get delivery. There's no, there's no um, impact from government. We're allowed to burn it. We've got to go and find it. We've got to get it delivered. Those facilities are in place. But we want to be sure that we can get it to market. And that's, what the, that's one of the things that we're concentrating on. And here's a big deal, carbon offset. We need to look at how we can develop countermeasures for carbon offset. It's a real thing. It's something never in my lifetime I thought we'd ever, to, ever have to think about. Never dreamt about it. It's now full on in our face. And this year, just to give you some idea, the worthy order of carters who have their annual marking ceremony in London have been faced with a huge tax, a thousand pounds, simply to hold that ceremony in the middle of London. And it's been placed there by the, the Mayor of London, the Lord Mayor of London. That's the sort of thing that we're looking at. So this is the NTET's role as far as coal is concerned. Railways, and I've said earlier, we need to stay close to the railways. They burn by far the most amount of coal and they'll have a lot of say in how things happen. But they don't have the same issues of getting coal to the point of use that we do. You can arrive at a railway uh, centre with your lorry, 
with your open bags or with your loose tipping trailer and dump it on the ground and away they go and do what they're going to do. Very, very rarely do they take it in sealed bags in the way that we do. And so one of the things that we're getting ready to lobby government about is to have bituminous coal put back into 25 kilo poly bags and labeled up heritage use, something that clearly marks it that we're using it in, in, in the way that it was in, is meant to be used, it's intended. We're thinking about those. We're told by some of the uh, distributors, LCC in particular, that um, quite frankly, uh, if you rip the top of the poly bag, the 25 kilo poly bag, you can take it. You can't have it delivered sealed. We've got to work out how that's going to work. We just don't know how that's going to work. We've got to get a handle on what's going up the chimney. We know what the railways are producing in terms of total tonnage of CO2. We've no idea what the road steam fraternity is doing. And we really do need to know. We've got to find that out. We are talking to a number of suppliers, CPL and a biofuel company in particular, and we're developing, we haven't got anywhere near the, the running thing, but we're talking about developing trials of suitable alternative bituminous coal. Bio coal, now it's being used in Europe and it's being used in America for steam trials. The problem is it doesn't smell very nice and it very easily gets lifted off the grate and thrown entirely up the chimney. You can finish up with no fire in your grate, ever so simple. So sizing uh, is an issue. Also, it's very low in calorific volume. It's akin to brown coal, the sort of coal that comes out of, say, uh, Australia. Very soft, obviously, uh, smells and can be smoky. So we've got to look at this very carefully, but we must look at it. We must say whether or not, hands on, we can work with it. And here's the rub, education. My personal concern is that the guy on the footplate of a traction engine <clears throat> is far closer to the antagonist than the person who stood on the footplate of a railway locomotive and I'm not being disparaging so one of the roles of the NTT is to give the engine owner sufficient tools sufficient uh, armor if you like in terms of explaining the situation it's no good just saying there I, I'm doing this as of right I've got every right to be on the on the road that is a fact but how we appear on the road what, how we can talk about, we're doing this sensibly, uh, we, we are mindful of the environment, we have got to pull those sort of attitudes into our conversations. It doesn't sit easy with lots of folk, there is no doubt about that. And I'm not here to sprinkle holy water or tell you that there's a silver bullet that's going to make this easy. It is not going to be easy. So if we're big enough, we've got to rise to this challenge as a family, as a huge family. And I put it to you that the success of what we're trying to achieve depends on absolutely everybody playing the game. To add to the fun, we've got the uh, advent of clean air zones. A clean air zone is defined as an area with targeted action taken to improve air quality. Uh, I was last year before lockdown, I was in a meeting in Birmingham listening to one of the environmental officer explaining how it's going to work in Birmingham. And they're, going to, they're talking about having large digital screens on side of prominent buildings displaying the amount of CO2 and other uh, noxious uh, particles uh, that are in the, in the air so that the, the, the inhabitants of Birmingham can get a good idea of, of what it's like where they're living. Flipping heck. Flipping heck. Right. There are, there are heritage exemptions, but they're inconsistent. Fever wanted exemptions to all vehicles of historic interest that were over 30 years of age. Well, in Scotland, they're thinking of that very strongly. The UK 
is letting its local authorities make their own policies. So we really got to get a grip on what's happening local to where we live and then work out how we're going to deal with it. And I can't give you an answer to that at the moment. Implementation has been delayed because of COVID. We might give a big sigh of relief. But if this is a money making exercise as well as a political one, then you can watch out. It is not going to go away. MOTs and 10 year old tires. This has caused us to scratch our heads a little bit because if road safety is at stake, then we've got to really think about what we're saying and what we're doing. Uh, in February this year, this new regulation, construction and use regulations were extended to say that tires that were 10 years of age or older on the front steering axles, trees, buses, coaches and trailers are banned. And I'll just remind you, for those of you that don't know, that this all came about because a bus ploughed into a young lad, burst front tyre, out of control, and killed the young lad. Terrible. It turns out that this tyre was second-hand. It had been fitted on Methuselah's bus. That's how old it was. And there was nothing to stop it being in use. It was of it would have passed its MOT because of the threads that were on it, but as a serviceable device, it was woefully inadequate. And nobody seemed to care. Well, the mother of this young lad cared enough to confront the government, created a lobby, and this is the result of it. Who's going to stand in her way? So anything that's over three and a half tons and less than 40 years old, has got to change its front tyres if they're 10 years of age or older. You can have your tyres retread, by the way. And that retreading, the date moves to the date of the retread for as long as the carcass would allow it to be retreaded. And that's in the hands of the retreader. Steam, any steam powered vehicle is exempt. But I ask you, if you're the owner of a steam powered vehicle with pneumatic tires on the front, to think very carefully about how old those tires are, how you service them, where you keep them, and what condition is the carcass really in. And I know this is an expensive choice. I really know that. Okay, all other VHIs, <clears throat> I can't read my own slide because my picture of all you guys is, a, is in my way. Let's just move it out of the way a second. Right. All of the VHIs, unless used for commercial purposes, that is hire or reward, or a HGV over 40 years old and registered after 1960, they're exempt. However, if you've got an HGV, that you use to move your tackle about. It's over 40 years of age and registered after 1960. It's still not exempt from MOT, whether or not it's carrying a load for any purpose, hire a reward or for your pal. It's got to be MOT. <clears throat> how do I know how old <clears throat> my tires are? If you look round the rim of your tyre, and I know lots of you will know this already, but I'm just making this point. If you look round the rim of your tyre, you will see stamped into it, embedded into it, a legend looking like this at the bottom of the screen. DOT, Department of Transport, that's an Americanism. Then some codes, U2LL, LMLR, that tells the inspecting person what duty that tire is rated for. It could be you've got the wrong tire on there. The size might be right, but it might not be able to do 120 mile an hour, which is what you're intending to do. But the important thing for this conversation is that 5107 is what we're looking for. The last four digits. In very old tires, there only used to be three digits. So if you've got a three digit 
tire on, then it's over 40 years of age, I'm afraid. It's got to go. So 5107 interprets says this tire was manufactured or retreaded in week 51 of year 2007. Okay. So that's what we're looking at there. I'll be very brief now. <clears throat> we spent a lot of time uh, developing our new online membership system. Some of you may already have taken advantage of it on a hope, hand on heart, that you, you, that you like what you've got. It's cloud-based. It, it's open 24 seven, anywhere in the world. If you're on holiday somewhere in some sunny place, oh, well, I do hope so. And you think, gosh, I've not played my subs. You can, there you are languishing at this poolside in some exotic place. You could renew your membership. Not a problem for as long as there's an internet signal, obviously. Use it on your laptop, your PC, your smartphone or your tablet. It's got lots of new features and we've extended the membership types that we have. We've combined the SAC and NTT data tables so that <clears throat> they're all in one place, everything's the same. Uh, and if you're an NTT person, you'll have an N in front of your number. And if you're an SAC person, then you'll have an S in front of your number. Brand new, this is about to go live. We're just it's all ready to go. We're just waiting to talk to you guys today and, to, and for the next issue of steaming and then it will be out and about. When you renew your membership or when you join, you will immediately receive an email, which you do anyway now, that says thank you for joining, welcome, etc. You also get attached to that email a PDF file that actually carries uh, a facsimile of your membership card. Now, if you join, then you will get a paper version of that card anyway, along with your welcome pack. If you're renewing, you'll be asked to say whether you want to continue only receiving your membership card by email or whether you want a paper copy. And you're encouraged to go to your uh, account and <clears throat> make those changes. So you, you get both if you say, if you don't do anything. But I would ask you to go to your account and take the tick or put the tick in the box that says, um, I want email cards only. That would be good. Let's uh, do a little bit for uh, <clears throat> the environment. and Let's keep the cost of running the NTT down because that's what it amounts to. Uh, the new system also allows you to take ownership of your data. You can change your address, you can change your telephone numbers, but this will only work for you if you've lodged your email address. And not everybody has. And I would uh, urge you to uh, get your email address onto the system and then you can look at your own data, you can look at the history of your payments and in the fullness of time, you can access the members only area within the NTT's website, which is now being developed. These are the new areas that we've got within the membership system. We've got the existing uh, single membership, an adult or one sponsored SAC. An SAC member is not allowed to join as an underage person, the NTT in their own right. They have to have their mum and dad or their grandmother or, or an uncle or an aunt. Somebody else has to sponsor and pay that money for the SAC, for the SAC member. We can have joint membership now we can have two people at the same address or we can have two sac members at the same address all with the same on the same membership ticket we can have family groups one account for a variety of family combinations on one payment date so what we've got is a family one group which is one adult and one sac or a family two group, which is one adult and two SAC, or family three group, which is two adults and one SAC, and family four group, which is two adults and two SAC. And there is facility, should we require it, to add to those groups as well. 
We've also got this innovation in it, trying to encourage our SAC members to stay with us when they come of age. So at age 18, an SAC member automatically becomes a member of the SAC, but as an ex-SAC member, but still paying the SAC rates. And when they become 21, right up until they become 22, they continue as a full-blown NTET member at 50% of the NTET rate in an encouragement to get them to stay with us. So I'm coming to the end here now. The environment, it's everybody's problem. Traction engines are not major polluters, but we all know what the eye sees, the heart grieves about. And that plays heavy on what we've got to pay attention to. The objective of the NTT, preserving our history with steam on the road. Sounds nice. Frankly, it's not that simple. It never has been. But today, there's never been any precedence for what we're facing today. The role of the NTET. Ha, ah, what does the NTET does? Ah, it's got many facets. It's got fingers in lots of pies, training, codes of practice. And it's a blend of fun and, of course, the serious. But regrettably, not everything we do is agreeable to everyone all of the time. And that gives us great concern, really does. We've got a potential for failure, quite bluntly. The NTT is run entirely by volunteers. It's a charitable organization. It, not only is it for the good of its, for the mem for it, of its members, it's also for the good of the community. It couldn't be a charity otherwise. So where's the inducement for someone to become a member of the NTET? They're getting things that a member gets. Well, the inducement is to help us put your hands in your pocket, pay your subscription and join us and help us in meeting the challenges of today and tomorrow. And these challenges are increasing. But ironically and dangerously, the tangible support, tangible support for the NTT is reducing. Some of it is age. We've been watching the magazines of late since last year. Some really important, very dear people have passed over. But that's not the entire solution. We expect that. We'd like people to walk towards us and not walk away from us. Thank you. Thank you, David. I've no doubt you'll have generated a number of questions. Some of them are already <laughs> on the Q&A chat line. Um, so now we will move on to but Charlie. Please tell us about towing and the law. Um, a question was raised about um, what you can tow behind a vehicle. Well, it's aimed mainly, I suppose, at the um, miniature owning members of the trust. But it, it does affect anybody who's got a trailer, so it's useful for everybody. So just quickly, um, in my history of uh, work, I used to um, build trailers, maintain them, and um, sell them and hire them, um, all to do with trailers under the 3,500 kilogram limit, which is what we're talking about here. So if you pass your test before the 1st of January 1997, you can drive a vehicle on your Category B entitlement up to 7,500 kilograms uh, MAM with a, trailer for as, um, with a trailer as long as the combination doesn't exceed 8,250 kilos. If it goes more than that, you need an HGV. Um, MAM is maximum authorised mass. It used to be um, maximum gross weight is the way it used to be written. As of the 1st of January 1997, a Category B licence holder uh, may tow using a car or a van up to an MAM of 3,500 kilograms with a trailer of up to 750 kilograms. You may tow a trailer that weighs more than that, but the combination must not exceed 3,500 kg. So if you've got a trailer that weighs 1,000, 
your towing vehicle can only have a, a maximum AM of 2,500. And it, it's on a sliding scale, as you can see. If you need to exceed that, you then need um, to take your category E, which will give you B plus E on your license. Okay, so that means then if you want to use, say, a three and a half thousand kilo vehicle and you want to tow a 2,000 kilo trailer, um, then you need to have your B plus E. So this is where the new license rules came in in 1997. It seems like yesterday to me, but it's actually a very long time ago. If you are a, a, an inexperienced driver, then it is recommended that you do not exceed 85% of the MAM. I have some information here for you on the trailers themselves, because there's lots of little things that you're probably not aware of. So the maximum size of your trailer is 2.55 metres wide by 7 metres long, which is quite big. Um, and if the trailer is unbraked, the maximum MAM is 750 kilos, or half the weight of the towing vehicle, whichever's the less. And there's probably a few people out there that didn't realise that. And then we look at some things have changed and come on in recent years. So two ways of connecting your lights up. There's the old way, which is using an N-type plug for your lights and an S-type plug for the caravan accessories. Um, but this has all been combined now. We've got a new way. It's the Euro plug. It's 13 ping. Um, one thing you need to note that if you fitted a Euro plug or your vehicle has a Euro plug, the reversing light function must work in the socket which is something that wouldn't have been there on the old ones. And if the vehicle is over 750 kilos, it must have a reversing light. And if it's over six meters long, it must have two reversing lights. And here's another one that people may not be so um, up to with, is the towing mirror law. And a lot of people are aware of, of towing mirrors and you can buy them and put them on and they all look a bit of a, uh, Heath Robinson idea when you look at them. But if you can see from this diagram, the law states that you must be able to see four metres away from the side of your trailer at a distance of 20 metres back, which is quite a long way. Um, and if you haven't got the right mirrors, if you look at the bottom part of this drawing, the yellow section, um, it gives you what's called an illegal blind spot. Because although you can see outwards and you can see back, you can't see anything coming up the inside. All right, so you must be able to see four meters out for a distance of 20 meters back. Since the 1st of August 1998, all tow bars fitted to cars must have type approval. And the number for those interested is EC94 stroke 20. The other thing you need to check is if you want to put a drop, drop plate or a spacer or a bike rack on your tow bar, you need to check that the type approval includes this because if it hasn't got it in the type approval, you can't fit it. And it's actually an MOT failure if the garage is up on it and is bothered to check in. But the interesting thing is, is that large vans, four transits, etc., or lorries, don't come under the type approval for tow bars. Um, so that might help one or two of you. And then the next thing is if you want to build your own trailer. Gone are the days where you took the mini subframe out and put a body on it and an A-frame and away you went. That's long gone. So since the 1st of October 1988, which is even further ago, um, all trailers with brakes must have what's called over and brake systems, which means they, when you go backwards, the automatic release the brakes so that you can uh, go backwards without getting out. Uh, there's probably a lot of us that are listening the older for where you got out and put the little catch over so that the brakes didn't work. But the, that's, that's that part of it. But since the 1st of January 2012, all new trailers must be type approved. Now that's quite an expensive route to go down. But there's also the IVA, which is very similar to what you do with a kit car. Uh, the cost, when I looked online, was about 70 quid. So that's not out of the way if you were building a, a special trailer to put your traction engine on or in. Um, you, you'd be able to do that and uh, you just take it down to your local uh, ministry test centre and they'd inspect it for you. And, and that would be that. So we've already done quite a bit on insurance today, but uh, yes, insurance comes into this. And I think a lot of this has now been covered in the two lots we've had. Um, so all vehicles require at least third party insurance. Um, damage caused by a trailer becoming detached is covered by the towing vehicle. So if you have the unfortunate um, embarrassment of a trailer coming off when you're towing it and it goes across the road and through Mrs. Uh, Wilson's 
brick wall, um, then you're covered for the damage to the wall, but you're not covered for damage to the trailer or its contents. Um, so this is where um, you need to check your goods in transit and also whether you have your trailer itself insured. Um, there's no legal requirement for that insurance, but it's probably with what you're carrying in the back of there worth the, uh, the cost of doing that. It's also worth noting that um, recover the cost of repair of lost trailer and all the load, and it must be covered by specific insurance policy. So as I say, uh, we're talking with the Walter Midgley stuff earlier on, it looks like your engine's covered by them as part of the insurance, but the trailer still wouldn't be, so you'd have to look at that. But you need to uh, note that a tow bar by some insurance companies is considered to be uh, a modification. Uh, and due to that, uh, you need to check your policy to find out uh, as to whether you are actually insured or whether there's an additional premium. Um, I would imagine that um, most policies um, it will be covered, but you do need to check that. Uh, I'm going to do a quick thing on the rally webinar, which we're doing next um, Saturday at 10.30. Um, it's open to anybody. It's uh, about the authorised events. Um, we've got Ian Stone from One Broker. He's, he's got a proposal to everybody about a group policy that the NTT would hold um, to try and make the insurance of an event cheaper. We're looking into uh, or developing actually um, some training for rally monitors and rally organisers based on the code of practice and health and safety. Um, it's going to be done with a workbook and there's going to be a bit more information on that. I think we've already mentioned it last year, but with COVID, not a lot's happened, but um, John Y, who's doing this for us, is going to come along and give us a bit of an update. We're hoping to be in a position to be able to start it next year. There's, we can't see that with the way things are at the moment, there's going to be a huge advantage in trying to do it now because obviously um, people can't meet and um, it's, it's the idea is to try and do it in a classroom. Although we could do it, we could teach it over Zoom with a bit of organisation. I will give, us a, give an update on where we are with organised events in the COVID situation. Um, we were due to have a speaker on animals uh, outdoor event, but unfortunately they're unable to make it. So we will hold that back for another time. We'll try and look at the updated information from the government. Um, as you know, it's a moving feast. So it's, you know, what's said today may be wrong tomorrow. Um, so I will update myself in the week so I know I've got the most up-to-date information on all that. And uh, we'll give you an update next week when we do it. David is also going to do a bit on coal for the rally organisers. A lot of the rally organisers aren't actually steam engine only people, so they probably aren't listening to this webinar today. So although if you join, you'll probably have to put up with some of what David said today as well. It's for the benefit of everybody, and um, we will um, attempt to get as much information out there for the rally organisers to help them in their decisions going forward. Um, I don't think we're going to see many events run this year, and uh, definitely not before August, if at all. And that's it from me. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we now move on to Nick with the Steam Apprentice Club. Good morning from the Steam Apprentice Club. Um, when I stood up in the meeting last year, I was wearing many hats as I'd just become acting chairman of the SAC, as well as already being driving days coordinator and editor of Racing Steam magazine. Uh, from the AGM prior to that meeting, we gained three new committee members and roughly a year ago, one of them, uh, Jim Huntley, took over editing the magazine and is doing a fantastic job. Also in last year's AGM, we gained newly elected member Louise Maunder. Uh, she's joined the SAC committee. She has a very enthusiastic son who's a member of the SAC uh, and the, the photo you can see is uh, Got a bunch of flowers for taking him to all of the driving days that year. On the subject of driving days, um, last year, as you can imagine, due to COVID, all but one of our driving days were cancelled. Uh, the majority of them were at the beginning of the year when uh, the first lockdown was in effect. So we had no choice but to cancel those. We were able to run, run one socially distanced event at Tinker's Park in Sussex in September which was at a time where up to six people were allowed to gather outdoors. So following a risk assessment and some changes to the usual way of running the event, we felt it possible we were to go ahead, albeit with some of the uh, precautions that we're all now used to. 
such as plenty of hand washing facilities, larger communal shelter areas, and apprentices bringing their own packed lunch. Uh, those attending that day were grouped into bubbles. So it was two apprentices and one engine driver, and those bubbles stayed separate from all of the other bubbles for the duration of the event. Um, the procedures we put in place for that driving day gave us hope that we might be able to run some more events this year, but with us still being in lockdown at the moment, uh, that's uncertain for the time being. We usually publish the list of annual driving days in the January edition of Raising Steam. Uh, we did opt to postpone that until the April edition, but unfortunately it looks like we'll be postponing that again until the July edition, just in order to give the events who might be able to put an event on just time to establish whether they can actually go ahead. Currently so far, the driving day at Stithian's showground in Cornwall has definitely been cancelled. Um, but we're in touch with the other driving days and we might be able to put some days on later on, on this year. So can you run a driving day? We're extremely grateful to those who run the driving days on behalf of the SAC, but we're also keen to add more dates to the calendar. If you're part of a group or an organization or a rally and you can get several full size or miniature engines together for in a private location for a day, we'd love to hear from you. A driving day is basically just a day of having a steam up with the apprentices with you and you show them how it's done. It's as simple as that. It's our duty to ensure that the days go ahead in a safe manner. And we appreciate that as an organiser of an event, when you start thinking about risk assessments and insurance requirements, that can be quite off putting. But in reality, it's all just common sense stuff and probably a lot easier than you're expecting. I'm happy to discuss what goes into organising a driving day with anyone who's interested. Another question that we get is, do the engine men at a driving day require a DBS check? And the answer to that is no, not for a driving day. Where the engine driver is only in contact with the SAC, SAC member for a one-off event, they don't require a DBS check as it's deemed there is not enough time to form a relationship with that child. And in most cases, the parent is still uh, asked to stay in attendance at the driving day anyway. If you've got any questions about driving days, please drop me an email. That's uh, sac.chairman at ntt.co.uk. Okay, looking forwards. Uh, things to look forward to this year. The Twitter Steam Rally, which is uh, is coming around for the second time this year. Uh, sorry, for its second time later on this year. The Twitter Steam Rally is the invention of one of our SAC members, Charlotte Cools, who was the winner of last year's Apprentice of the Year Award. It's the, uh, the second Twitter Steam Rally is planned for the 1st of May, and it's a great opportunity for our members to get involved with the wider Steam community. We'll be pushing this on our social media and in our magazine quite a lot as well. Last year's event saw over 10,000 people taking part from Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, Greece, Germany, France, Denmark, and as well as all over the UK, and they managed to raise over £3,000 for charity. Uh, we've also got uh, our usual series of competitions that we normally hold, hold uh, in time for the Dorset Steam Fair. Obviously, with that not going ahead this year, uh, we'll be running those online instead, but it's another opportunity for our members to get involved. We have colouring competitions, photo competitions, and, and a model competition. Right. I can't speak in this report without our usual plea for articles for raising steam. Jim Huntley is doing a fantastic job, but he can only publish the material that he receives. Articles in raising steam don't just have to come from apprentices, they can come from anyone. And whether it's just a few words and a photo about a day out you had on your engine or a more technical article about maintenance work, we'll, we'll welcome anything that's interesting. Uh, Jim can be emailed on sac.raisingsteam at ntt.co.uk. The SAC has two annual awards, uh, the Technical Achievement Award and the Apprentice of the Year Award. Uh, the Apprentice of the Year Award is to recognise an apprentice who has shown all round enthusiasm in their involvement with road steam, either as hands-on experience with an engine or helping to maintain or restore an engine. Consideration should be given to how they have learnt and used the necessary skills needed in the operation of an engine. Ideal candidates as an SAC 
apprentice who has made an effort, shown willingness to learn, and has shown great enthusiasm for the hobby. Submissions should consist of just a brief description of what they've been doing and why you think the apprentice deserves the award and perhaps a few photos of what they've been doing. The Technical Achievement Award is for an apprentice who has been involved in the more technical side of our hobby, such as the restoration of an engine, building of a miniature, or any kind of engineering work related to road steam. The aim is to encourage a membership to develop hands-on skills that are useful in our hobby. Nominations for this award can be from a sponsor or even from the apprentice themselves. Uh, we're also expect it doesn't have to be uh, work completed in the past year. It can be uh, any time in in uh, the recent past. Uh, please send nominations for either of these awards to sac.chairman at ntt.co.uk. Uh, we usually make a final decision on recipients uh, in late summer in time for uh, an announcement and trophies to be awarded at the November AGM. And uh, I think that's pretty much it from the SAC at the moment, but uh, hope everyone has a nice summer and uh, is able to get out some rallies. Thank you, Nick. So we now move to our president, Mr. Andrew Semple. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a challenging time, as we all know, um, and it's been very much the case with uh, BEST uh, being greatly affected by the pandemic. The closure of many railway workshops 12 months ago and the need for only key staff or greatly reduced numbers of people in workshops had an effect on our trainees, the BEST trainees. And indeed railway workshops today are still working under difficult conditions Yet many of them report that a demand for outside services from their workshops is good. Uh, and that's encouraging in itself. However, this meant that our last group of trainees had some difficult times. Some had to move location and resulted in our training manager, Martin Wadsden, arranging much online learning. The last six trainees have now come to the end of their placements and I'm delighted to say that five of the last group of six have obtained employment. Uh, one has been taken on by a modern railway signaling company who felt that the trainees background training particularly in basic skills was a great asset. Anyway over the last eight years BEST has obtained over a million pounds in funds for training and has resulted in some 15 apprentice boilermakers and a similar number of others who are trained in engineering on the rest of the loco, if I can put it like that. Um, there have also been some people who have enjoyed the courses without external funding. Now, it, it's clear that the lottery will be unlikely to fund any more of this type of work in the short term, as all funding is now going to be directed to getting existing operations up and running for the benefit of the economy. So for the future, BEST is going to have to stand on its own feet. With this in mind, we've been looking at effective ways of offering short courses in specialist skill areas, much of which could be online learning and also at the end of the course, online assessment. Uh, we already offer courses in riveting and boiler washouts, which have been taken up by railways and boiler workshops. And we're also working closely with one railway on a new course for carriage restoration and maintenance. We're exploring ways of training in such areas as retubing, boiler staying, patch screws, corking, bearings, white metalling and the like, so that anyone who's either in a workshop or doing a restoration at home can basically dip in and top up their knowledge. So as the years go by, the associated knowledge and skills move further away from everyday living. And it appears that very few schools now have a workshop where children are even taught basic safe use of hand tools and so on. So if we are to continue to attract young people to our heritage movement, there will be a need to pass on the knowledge. 
This involves young people and our area of STEAM has an excellent following of young people, thanks to the enthusiasm and support of you, the engine owners and crews. You see, railways, of course, are very restricted by law as far as the involvement of youngsters is concerned. And many look to ways of finding and fostering this interest. Best is looking at how we can possibly help in this area. It's interesting that several railways uh, have now started to get involved with miniature railway operations, which they, are, uh, they see as, as a way to help them develop the young interest in their railways so that in time and with appropriate age, they can bring them forward onto the, to the railways themselves. We're very flexible in BEST, and we welcome any ideas and input from anyone who has an interest in seeing our hobby and its associated skills continue to flourish for the future. As each generation passes, we're getting further away from those who did it for real. So we must ensure that the knowledge, the correct knowledge and the proper skills are taken forward for the future. Uh, so if you've got anything you'd like to discuss, you know, you, you've got ideas, suggestions, whatever, do feel free to get in touch with us. You can get in touch with BEST. We have a website. Uh, you can email Gordon Newton, of course, um, who's the chairman. Or indeed, if you really can't uh, do anything else, you're welcome to get in touch with me as well. So there we are. That's uh, BEST. Thank you very much, chairman. Thank you, Andrew. So we're about to uh, get to the last speaker on today's agenda but just before I finish I would like to just remind everybody about insurance that Martin Levers was talking about the Walker Midgley policy. If you are insured with anybody else make sure that you make the necessary inquiries. We have only had answered the inquiries today with regard to Walker Midgley. So please be, be aware of that. So thank you to all the others who've contributed and I'll now ask our chairman Rob Wing uh, to wing it through the last part of the conference this morning. Thank you, Bob. Uh, what an interesting morning. I've learned a huge amount of uh, knowledge about the details of what we do and what we don't. First of all, thank you to all of our speakers who have talked so eloquently and, and completely on, on the subjects that concern all of us as uh, members of the National Traction Engine Trust. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm the new broom that's uh, been in, in office only a few months and most of my colleagues uh, and trustees that uh, are with us today are time served for many years and decades and so I defer completely to their, to their knowledge and skill. I don't wish to, to re revisit issues that uh, speakers have um, talked about today, but I, 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 there's a couple of bits and pieces that I'd like just to, to reaffirm, if I could, please. Um, membership is one issue that is, is really important. We are, the time is ticking for, for the trust. We are sadly facing a reducing membership, and that is due uh, in many respects to, to age, our ability to be understood, and, and how we present ourselves to the movement as a whole. And I just want to, to stop on, on the presentation of the trust to the wider membership. And it's something that uh, the trust and its communications group is looking very seriously and, and deeply into. How can we better communicate? We live in a very fast changing world. Um, the last 12 months have been a complete revelation of, of change. And who would have thought that in 2020, at this time of the year, we would have been facing complete lockdown for many, many weeks and months and over three separate times of the year. So 
we need as a trust to embrace the methods in which we can join with our membership and the wider movement because as david has uh, spoken of earlier i believe uh, most passionately that the trust has never been more relevant for those of us who enjoy going to a steam rally having a play with an engine meeting our friends having a pint of beer and just enjoying the steam movement and it's really really important that, that we keep ourselves relevant so if you've got a friend that's that's not quite sure about the trust or you've had a discussion and and they're really unclear please do uh, encourage them to come to one of our webinars our webinars have been very successful we we feel that um we launched on a very big issue which david's touched on uh, this morning coming clean about coal and this is a very serious uh issue for all uh members of the movement who burn coal so we also recognize that webinars are a method of communication but they've also it's part about sharing fun and one of the issues that we've faced in the last 12 months and sadly in the coming four five six months we will this will continue is we won't be able to have any fun and that's the one of the pillars of the the trust apart from managing legislation and regulation which david very clearly articulated and nick has dealt with education in our steam apprentice club but we're in this to have a bit of fun and so your trust is going to or has just about formulated a program of webinars which will involve uh, me traveling a little bit up and down the country with a camera and going to see some some of our, our, our well-known members of the trust and also some of the facilities that are growing within our movement um, we've got some great engineering sites we've got some lovely young people we've got a doctor a young cornish doctor who specializes in sign writing and is uh, a, a trustee of the uh, showground can't remember the name dingle step dingle showground so there's uh, um, martin oliver and and there's a whole lot of other people i don't really want to let the let the program out of the bag but please do watch out for our webinars in 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 the coming weeks and months and we recognize that in the summer people will be slightly busier hopefully than in the winter so if you see a gap in the schedule please don't think we've forgotten because the winter's coming and we want to engage with you then um part of our communications package is we've um well you should just have received uh, the fifth newsletter that our uh, general secretary naomi is putting together and these are in their infancy so in the in the spirit of best communication if you, if you're getting a newsletter and one of your friends or colleagues isn't please do you know ask them to pop their membership sorry their uh, email into uh, naomi which is general secretary at ntet.co.uk and this is free and open to all you don't have to be a member of the trust to receive our newsletter if you think there's something that's missing or you'd like to hear about something or there's a, a service we're not talking about please do drop us a line because as i mentioned earlier we're on a journey of refreshing our offering and we're listening and we're asking for um, knowledge to be shared between our members and those perhaps that are considering joining us in the trust so we need your help and, and finally that help sits in the literal one as david said earlier we're spread quite thin as a band of volunteer trustees so if you've got a few hours a month or or, or just a particular time where you feel you could offer some help please do get in contact with with me chairman at ntet.co.uk because every little helps in in the adage and we really would appreciate your contact but but that's me done i just want to say thank you bob for um managing this this very interesting uh morning i've thoroughly enjoyed it and i hope that all of you who've been with us as attendees have as well so thank you thanks rob well that leaves me just to wind it up hopefully um 
Well, we shall be running uh, more webinars, as Rob has said, uh, but hopefully we will be able to meet again properly at the beginning of the next year, 2022, because we do a lot of things uh, just chatting amongst whilst uh, at the meeting. So a lot of work is done there as well, just out of the formal part of the meeting. So the other thing is, if there are questions from the meeting and you've not had your question answered today, email it to the General Secretary. We'll publish all the questions with their answers on the website and in steaming. And there'll be a recording of the conference available in due course. The final thing today is if you haven't visited the sales area of the website, please do so. There are plenty of things to look at there. And we've obviously missed you, or Kathy has missed you, from the Killsby meeting. So with that, I'd like to close the meeting and thank you very much.